after rounds of intense competition. From a total of 39, we're down to the last four teams standing. One last battle remains and one last hurdle to overcome. Who will emerge victorious in the grand final? Tonight, everything is on the line as we crown the winner of the National STEM Championship 2023. to the grand final of the National STEM Championship 2023. I'm Sonia Chu. Now, it's been a long road to get here, but our top four teams cannot relax just yet. Tonight, they will face challenges that test their mettle to the max. So without further delay, let's meet our grand finalists. This team got a second chance in the wildcard round and they didn't waste it. Give it up for Raffles Girls School! <laughs> I help to create foods which are healthy and nutritious, yet can be customised to fit the needs of people at any point in time. The healthcare workers in Singapore greatly inspire me to become a neurologist as I believe there are many advancements that can still be made in this field. I would like to be a forensic scientist and combine my love for science to help solve murder cases. I would like to be an ophthalmologist, an eye doctor, and infuse math and computing into the field to advance eye care technology because I have a vision for the future. Next up is the team that beat out last year's first runner-up to earn a spot in tonight's grand final. It's Tomasic Junior College! <laughs> I wish we were a game developer to create more fun and interesting games that provide an avenue of relaxation away from mental stresses of life. I want to be a biomedical engineer. I firmly believe that the sole purpose of science and technology is for the betterment of people's lives. My passion lies in the field of research, specifically in the field of medical sciences. I hope to contribute to our healthcare sectors in the future by leveraging on our rapidly developing science and technology so as to assist people on the ground. Our next team is a dark horse that not many predicted would go all the way. So please, let's hear it for Anglo Chinese School Independent! <laughs> I want to be a neuro engineer. The potential for intelligence in computers is far greater than the potential of intelligence in biology. And hence, integrating these two will change humanity for the better. I want to make healthcare more accessible and affordable, and I hope to do this by doing research and development into niche healthcare sectors in the future. I'm passionate about STEM, particularly software engineering, because of how it allows for innovation. I want to be an inventor that pushes the boundaries of what's possible. I want to introduce ideas to this world that have never been thought of before. And our final team has much to live up to as their seniors brought home last year's trophy. Give it up for Raffles Institution! I wish to use what I have learned in physics and computer science to find data-driven, technology-based solutions to problems such as sustainability and climate change. I'd like to be a clinician scientist to bring together basic science and clinical applications to benefit healthcare. I hope that people in society will be more aware of global issues and hence everyone can play a part to create a better future. I want to utilise the areas of biology and chemistry to do research in the biomedical field to solve humanity's healthcare problems. Welcome teams! Now, it's time to introduce the panel that holds your fate in their hands, well, at least for today. I'm nervous too, but excited at the same time. Please put your hands together for Associate Professor Lim Tit Meng, Chief Executive, Science Centre Singapore. Dr. Darren Tan, Senior Specialist, Physics, Curriculum Planning and Development Division, MOE. Also joining us, Dr. John McGarva, Head of Design Engineering for Dyson, representing the James Dyson Foundation. And of course, we also have Assistant Professor Lo Huan Tian, President's Assistant Professor, National University of Singapore, NUS. Last but not least, Professor Lisa Ng, Executive Director, Biomedical Research Council. 
and please welcome guest of honor, Minister of State for Education and Manpower, Ms. Gan Xiao Huang. Now, the first challenge for the grand final was held at the NUS Research Center on Sustainable Urban Farming, also known as SURF. Let's see what our grand finalists had to do. Welcome to the NUS Research Center on Sustainable Urban Farming, or SURF. SURF was launched on 5th of August 2022 to enhance Singapore's food security by developing high-tech solutions for urban farming. SURF's interdisciplinary team, with expertise spanning from plant and food science to 3D imaging and data analysis, hopes to make food production more efficient and sustainable. But why is there this urgent need to research sustainable farming methods? One of the major issues in the world now is uh, climate change. And that really will affect our traditional farming because extreme heat and drought will not be good for uh, agriculture. One of the solutions for that is to grow plants indoor so we can guarantee food supply throughout the year. And now, it was each team's turn to design a next-generation urban farm for Singapore. But first, they were randomly assigned a scenario to work with. Let's check in on Tomasic Junior College, who were given the task of designing an urban green infrastructure to optimise land use. We started brainstorming. In the end, we came up with firstly, which is the rooftop, where we plant trees in rows and have potato veins to hang over the edge of the buildings. And then our second one is for the MRT walls, because the MRT walls are really unused, so you want to maximise the space efficiency of it. And lastly, we are thinking of the corridors of the university having plants so as to reduce the temperature of the whole entire university. Next up, Raffles Institution had to reimagine an outdoor farm using innovative technology. I felt that the hardest part of this challenge was certainly the hands-on aspect of making the prototype to not only be structurally stable, but aesthetically pleasing as well. In the end, we did find some innovative ways to allow the prototype to fulfil both of the criteria, and we are quite happy with the prototype. And now, on to Anglo-Chinese School Independent. They had to design commercial and or communal spaces to involve the community. Our product is engaging to the community for them to learn and have like a taste of hydroponics. So we tailored the difficulty level such that they are able to draw their own conclusions. And also our product is also sustainable in the fact that it is motorised and fully autonomous. The nutrient solution can be reused and recycled. It's Raffles Girls School's turn. They were tasked with designing a technological indoor farm. The strategy that we adopted was to first decide on some features that we wanted to include and for this we drew inspiration from the tour. From there we decided on our rough idea of our prototype and slowly started constructing it. Our goal was just to work on our presentation and ensure that we could communicate our ideas clearly to the judges. After one hour and 15 minutes flew by just like that, it was time for their four-minute presentations. So many underground MRT stations such as the Tampines West MRT have giant unused spaces above their MRT doors. So we can utilise these spaces by placing a hydroponic system there to grow crops. PJC did quite well in presenting the ideas. They say they want to implement hydroponics uh, in the MRT station. I think that's a good idea actually. So our hydroponic system will use the neutron film technique which allows the hydroponic system to be presented aesthetically as well as allowing for a more efficient way of delivering nutrients and water to these uh, microgreens. This system actually has a two-tiered system as you can see here. This two-tiered system allows for both sun-loving plants and shade-loving plants to grow and thrive. Our system also includes AI monitors for both tiers of our system which can allow the plants to be monitored of their needs and also the status of the environment around them. I was especially impressed by RI uh, because according to my personal opinion, this group specifically creative by designing their own facility. For the role of students, uh, there can be CCAs to, to plant and teach them and it can also be taught in schools about hydroponics in biology. And for the role of companies, uh, schools can partner with local businesses as sponsors and in return, the businesses will receive branding and community engagement. Uh, how this works is that um, the plants will kind of be floating on a nutrient solution. So ACSI, the idea itself is interesting, but I'm more concerned about the practicality of the project. Any practical uh, difficulty in carrying out this project? 
There are some constraints, for example, the management of the pH system, but I think that this is quite a negligible factor because of the mass of the water, so it's sort of a buffer against like changes in pH. And also the AI system also handles most of the tough work, so students are able to use this quite effectively, I would say. Introducing our technological indoor farm, which is mainly for strawberries. So firstly, we made use of red and blue lights in our setup. And the reason why we did this is because the wavelengths of red and blue lights are more readily absorbed by plants as shown in this graph here. We intend to have like a multi-storied ebb and flow system, so ideally three to four units. So I think that's something new that we learned from urban farming was more about the indoor aspect of it and what goes into ensuring that it runs smoothly. Now for the on-site challenge, teams were scored on content, practicality, creativity, presentation and teamwork. Scores in this round have a weightage of 30%. So how did the teams fare? I'm really curious. Let's take a look at the leaderboard. In first place, Raffles Institution with 26.2, ACSI with 23.5, TJC 22.3, and RGS with 22.25. Let's please give them a big round of applause for all their efforts. And don't worry, there's still three more rounds to go. But before that, let's go for a break. to the grand final of the National STEM Championship 2023. Now, things are still up in the air as it's only round two, the hands-on challenge. The Singapore University of Technology and Design, or SUTD, is widely known for its excellence in engineering, innovation, design and technology. But what did the teams think about it? So the thing that stood out most to me during the tour was the many exhibits in the library. For example, there was a wheelchair which had motors in it to help the elderly stand up easier. So all these things show like the lots of innovation happened here and what technology can do for all of us. The thing that stood out the most about the tour today was to fly a drone. And it was the first time I've actually flown a VR drone. So I was able to see things from the perspective of the drone itself. The facilities that SUTD has to offer for students, such as the 3D printers, really help students to let loose their creativity and be able to innovate and design. Innovation and design, that's exactly what SUTD aims to bring to the table. A foundation in mathematics, science and technology will result in innovations much like this 3D printed electric vehicle. But by now, teams were itching to hear about their challenge. So what we're going to do is related to our food security and also sustainability. We actually gave the students a black fungus. Food security is important and since these mushrooms are grown in Singapore, I think it's right for us to think how do we make use of the solar energy to enhance the value of such food. The toughest part of this challenge would be bringing all of the different variables and components in the drying oven and seeing how we can optimise all of them to get the best results based on whatever data we collect. The students need to collect data, build their device, and to understand how to improve upon their prototype. We need to work with the limited materials that we have, and I think that poses quite a big constraint for us. I think that several factors that we can take into consideration include maximizing how efficient our prototype is, as well as how innovative it is. I feel like there's a lot of other factors that we have to consider, for example, the time and the cost as well when it comes to sustainability. So I hope that students can learn a little bit of the design innovation thinking process and learn to solve problems in a more interdisciplinary way. So they will find that STEM knowledge is essential. It's time for our teams to present their hands-on challenge. Judges will be on the lookout for effectiveness functionality, the built quality of the prototype, practicality of the solution, and the design process. Scores in this round have a weightage of 15%. These black fungus mushrooms are so cheap. Let's keep these 20 packets in the fridge so they don't grow mold. But wait, mushrooms are 90% water. That's a lot of moisture. A little less warmth won't do much to prevent the mushrooms from growing mold. Fret not, for our stackable sun sierra is here to save the day. It's sustainable, easily scaled up, 
with efficiently integrated parts made with affordable materials, user-friendly and space-efficient. Our final prototype draws inspiration from a steamer and its three main components. A hot air inlet, a vertical chamber and a lid to facilitate the loading process of the mushrooms. And these are the components that make up our prototype. Our prototype has holes as well as a solar power fan strategically integrated at the bottom of the structure. This increases air ventilation and allows the water vapour to escape through the holes in the roof, lowering the humidity. It also has three layers of tiered metal grills to make our prototype space efficient as well as user friendly as laying out the mushrooms becomes intuitive. The body of our prototype is made of acrylic and the roof is also made of acrylic which is affordable, easy to cut, as well as allows for the greenhouse effect to increase internal temperatures. This allows our prototype to be scalable and sustainable should it be mass-produced. This dryer has an amazing effectiveness of 54,600 milligrams per kilowatt hour. It surely sounds amazing. Uh, what are some of the challenges associated with trying to scale up this solution that you've developed? It's easy to scale up in the sense that you can mass produce many copies, but if you want to make it like larger scale, for example, bigger or taller, then it might not be very feasible to stack like that many layers as you will need a ladder to be able to load the mushrooms in. Yeah, so that would be one of the potential problems that we might face. So if it's not taller, if it's bigger, what are the areas that you can look at to make it more effective? One idea we considered was actually having slanted air vents at the side have like an extra channel of airflow to heat up the mushrooms. It's also possible for us to add more than one fan. So instead of just one at the bottom, we could have fans at like the intermediate layers between the mushrooms so that there's a continuous circulation of air throughout the entire structure. Oh no! Why are my mushrooms slimy and discoloured? And the smell too! Yucks! What do I do now? Fred not. We got a solution just for you. Introducing our solar dryer to dry your mushrooms to a crisp. Wow, how does it work? So you just open the lid and place your mushrooms in. Place it in a sunny area. So our solar dryer works on two principles. Firstly, it works like a greenhouse. So when solar insulation strikes the black interior, most of it is absorbed, but some is reflected as long wave radiation. This long wave radiation is then absorbed by the air trapped within its system, thereby increasing its temperature. Notice that there are openings at the top and bottom of our dryer, and we'll be using them for effective circulation. When insulation strikes the black interior of our dryer, the air inside gains heat and expands, causing it to be less dense. This hot air rises and flows through the drying chamber of our dryer and escapes through the top opening. Because of this displacement of hot air, fresh air is drawn in from the bottom opening and this cycle repeats, allowing for effective circulation of air which drives moisture out. And this is otherwise known as the chimney effect. So we ran quite a few tests and we found we were able to remove approximately 52 grams of water in just a few hours of drying. And by doing the quick math as well as integration, we found we had an efficiency value of 1.35 kilograms per kilowatt hours. I know as part of the materials, uh, you were also given a solar panel and a fan. Could I maybe find out you know, what were the considerations that led you not to use these materials that were provided? Uh, for our calculations, we had to take into account our total surface area that we use for our prototype. So we mainly focus on this vertical design to decrease the surface area uh, calculations when we are looking down. So in order to implement our solar panel into our design, we had to increase the surface area, leading to decreased efficiency. And to add on, uh, the solar panel is also quite costly. So if you are thinking of it being used commercially and in terms of like uh, household usage, instead of buying this at say less than $10, you have to pay for the solar panel, which is probably two, three times more expensive than what it already is. Good afternoon, esteemed judges. Today, we'll be presenting our prototype for an efficient yet cost-effective solar dehydrator and walk you through our design process. So firstly, this is black because black is the most absorbent among the other colours. It is the best absorber and emitter of heat. So we chose this very peculiar shape, which was frankly pretty hard to make. It's called a dodecahedron. It's a 12-sided dice. So basically, it, is, it allows um, an increased exposed surface area to the light so that the mushroom can gain heat quicker. And this also increases the internal reflections and further amplifies the greenhouse effect. There is a fan that blows heat directly through the mesh onto the mushroom. So this dispels the moisture and dries the mushroom. The air comes from this heating zone, which has baffles, and also this, this piece of folded paper, which is basically used to, again, increase the exposed surface area so that it can gain heat and radiate heat into the air quicker so that the air can reach a higher temperature before reaching the mushroom. 
when we tested our prototype, the grass or ground temperature was at 36 degrees Celsius, while our prototype reached a peak temperature inside here of 58 degrees Celsius. So for our final calculation, we obtained a total solar energy usage of 0.208 kilowatt hours, giving us a final efficiency value of 407,000 in terms of milligrams divided by kilowatt hours. How do you manage to maintain the taste or texture of the, the mushrooms? Actually, we also did a taste test before and after. <laughs> so, <laughs> after doing the drying, we actually rehydrated it with warm water after, like, to its original mess, and it actually still tasted the same. Yeah. Have you considered and determined, actually, how many layers or channels are enough? to a certain point, right? The layers also don't increase surface area that much also because below the layers, you actually have a strip of sort of folded paper material. So this also helps to increase the total exposed surface area. So with regards, you were talking about laminar flow and also we also took that into consideration because let's say if we were to remove all the baffles, right, the flow will be completely turbulent and that means you won't be able to direct the air nicely and have achieved even heating. So in this case, I think laminar flow would still be the best. Yeah, we actually took incense and used the smoke to see the, the airflow and we realised that at first we didn't have this many baffles we realised that it was still flowing too fast it wouldn't heat up sufficiently before the air gets blown through the heating chamber uh, 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 boy, uh, Why is this box so heavy? Uh, uh. You said you wanted 20 mushrooms Yes, I said 20 mushrooms not 20 packets of mushrooms Now we're gonna waste so much food but why can't we just store them and eat them later? No, these mushrooms contain a lot of water, which makes it easy for bacteria to grow on them. Then why don't we just dry them and evaporate the water? It's not easy as that. They take days to dry under the sun. Hi there, I'm from Griffos & Co. And we have just the perfect product for you. The Griffos Solar Oven was developed after countless different designs and iterations. In order to test our prototypes, we left 100 grams of mushrooms inside of them to dry until they reached 16% of the initial mass before calculating effectiveness. Now, let's look at our first prototype. Our first prototype consisted of a black rectangular box with the half the space dedicated towards a heating box. The other half was covered with a clear acrylic which allowed sunlight to fall upon the mushrooms. In addition, the base of the box was light with a metal wire that can heat up and help dry the mushrooms. However, this prototype came with several problems. First of all, it was very complicated with many small bits and pieces that were hard to clean and store. Secondly, it was also rather flimsy. And lastly, the heating box did not help to accelerate the rate at which the mushrooms dried as it took up a large surface area with little to no increase in effectiveness. In order to improve from the flaws of our initial design, we came up with this final prototype. It consists of a flat metal mesh under an inclined acrylic plane inside of a black container. It is more sturdy, has a higher drying capacity, is easy for you to use as it has less loose parts, and is easy to clean, requiring only a few quick wipes. It only uses easily sourced materials and is highly cost-effective. It's also environmentally friendly as it does not use any electricity. Its simple design also makes it easy to manufacture and scale. What was your biggest failure in this process and what did you learn from it? Uh, I believe that our biggest failure was definitely uh, our first prototype as we found out that it did not have a very high effectiveness. By embracing failure, we managed to follow the design thinking process and come up with a better product for the end consumer. With that, we wrap up round two, the hands-on challenge. The judges have tabulated the raw scores for round two and it's time to reveal them. Raffles Girl School with 85, TJC with 80, ACSI with 90 points, Raffles Institution with 75 points. All right. Seems like it could be anyone's game at this point. Now remember, round two has a weightage of 15%. After tallying all the scores, let's take a look at who's currently leading. Raffles Institution, 37.45. ACSI with 37. RGS with 35. And TJC with 34.3. A very tight race right now, I have to say. Now, very soon, it is going to be time for round three, audience's choice. Why is it called that? Because in this round, we turn the power over to you, the audience. 
When they first arrived in the studio, the audience was given a QR code with four STEM questions. But they could only choose one question for one team to answer. So, did they pick an easy question for their team or did they choose a difficult question for an opposing team? But team, since this is the grand final, it's not so simple. There's going to be a twist. Each STEM question is tagged to a mystery celebrity. And this celebrity must be a part of your team's three-minute presentation. So let's find out the results of audience's choice and who your mystery celebrity is. RGS, your audience has chosen. Your team gets question two. Your mystery celebrity is the co-host of Clarity's Hush podcast and also my colleague on 98.7, is Jermaine Tan. RGS, let's go! All right, TJC, the audience has chosen and you are getting question three. Your mystery celebrity is yes to Sansan DJ and familiar face on the darker show, it's Chenning. ACSI, the audience has chosen. Your team gets question number four. Your mystery celebrity, well, you might have seen her on dramas like Sunny Side Up, Code of Law Spin Off, Forensic. Please give it up for Yuslina Yuso. R.I. This means you got question number one. Your mystery celebrity is someone you probably would have seen on dramas like Kin, Code of Law. Let's give it up for actor, model and host is Aaron Mosedeg. Aaron, I wanted to ask you, how do you feel you're going to contribute to your team? I am here to give them 100% of my support. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> okay, so I'm going to ask Chen Ning now. Chen Ning, what kind of um, elements can you add on to your team? Wow, I think I'll just do my best and they'll do the rest. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay, Jermaine, do you feel like you're going to be more of a hindrance or a help? I think I'm what they call a personality hire. I see. So okay. I will bring that to the team. Um, but Great. the brain cells will have to come from you guys. Thank you very much. <laughs> oh, okay. I think it's going to be a good balance there. Okay, last but not least, Yuslina, uh, were you fantastic at science in school? Definitely not. <laughs> <laughs> but, but, but I will really try my best to be the best for you guys, okay? Yes. Okay, well, give them a big round of applause for the confidence they have here today. I'm looking forward to it. Now, teams, what's going to happen is you will have 20 minutes to work with your celebrity guest on some answers and your presentations as well. So think of how you want to weave them in as well. I wish you all the best. All the best, guys. Good luck. While the teams and their celebrities are working hard, we'll be taking a break. See you in a bit. Welcome back to the grand final of the National STEM Championship 2023. All our teams have engaged in really deep and intense discussions with their celebrities. Now it's time to see if their hard work has officially paid off. Here's how it's going to go. Judges will be assessing creativity of the presentation, clarity of content and teamwork. Scores in this round have a weightage of 25%. Raffles Girls School, you guys are paired up with Jermaine and you're up first. Your question was question two. What do these numbers printed on plastic containers represent? Explain why certain plastics are single-use, recyclable, reusable or not. I'm excited to see this. Your three minutes, it begins now. Wait, stop! Why are you throwing this away? This is a pet. You can recycle it. This is a pet? A woof woof? No, no, no. Not Why would you ask pet. me to recycle my pet? This pet stands for polyethylene terephthalate. Oh. And it has a resin identification code of one. In fact, there are seven resin identification codes. For example, this has a code of two, and this has a code of five. Generally, resin identification codes of one, two, and five are easy to recycle. 3, 4 and 7 are less easy to recycle and 6 is the least recyclable. It's very confusing to me. Don't worry, I have a few friends who can help you out. I'm single-use plastic. Well, I can be found in many places actually, such as the syringes in hospitals and even the straws that, that are used to drink your drink during lunch. Okay, but I'm so detrimental to the environment. Why do I even exist? Well, this is because of hygiene reasons. If I were to be recycled or reused, 
um, the plastic might not be able to decontaminate well and this might result in more serious implications should I be recycled or reduced. Hi guys, I'm reusable plastic. Basically, I have many forms. I can even be milk cartons, soda bottles or even bottle caps. I can withstand repeated use without degrading because I am just built different. Oh <laughs> yeah, yeah. She's built different. Okay, yeah. play. Hi guys, I'm recyclable plastic and I'm a thermoplastic. Did you know that 75% of all thermoplastics can be recycled as we can be softened upon heating? I exist in pet beverage bottles as well as HPDE milk jugs. Guys, always remember, you are not useless because even trash can be recycled. <laughs> Up next, we have Tomasic Junior College and Chen Ning. And the question that you got was question three. Why does lightning tend to strike tall buildings? Explain how buildings are equipped to deal with possible lightning strikes and suggest how we can protect ourselves during a thunderstorm. Your three minutes begins now. I am a tall building. I am a taller building. Oh no, the taller building has been struck by lightning. Why is this so? I'm struck by the lightning because I'm closest to a cloud, so it's easiest to reach me. Taller buildings need to protect themselves. But how? They use lightning rods. Lightning rods are usually metals, as they provide a path of lower resistance for the currents to flow from the top of the building to the ground. In addition, the lightning rods are also pointed, as the current will be more attracted to the rod, thus allowing the current to flow to the ground. The rain is getting heavier. Let's find shelter. A tree! Let me crash down underneath it! No, 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 no! You shouldn't hide on me because I don't have any mechanisms to prevent you from the shocking. But instead, you should move to somewhere of lower elevation and to crouch down. Okay, okay, let me lie down. No, 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 no. You shouldn't lie down. Lying down increases your surface area of the ground, which makes you more prone to being struck by the lightning. Instead, you should curl yourself into a ball. Oh, I see. And cover your hands with your head. So in conclusion, Lightning is electricity and electricity wants to flow the path of least resistance. So when there's a thunderstorm, the particles in the clouds will collide with each other, transferring charges. So this causes the clouds to be negatively charged and the ground to be positively charged. And the current wants to be flow to the ground for it to be grounded. To protect yourself from getting struck by lightning, don't ever hide under the tree. If not, you'll get cooked with the tree. Thank you so much, the Masik Junior College and Channing. And now, it's time for Anglo-Chinese School Independent and you, Selena, to present. Here was the question that you received. Explain how sunglasses protect our eyes while still allowing us to see. Is it important for sunglasses to have a UV coating? Why or why not? What additional features do polarized lenses confer? Your time begins now. Okay, guys, how's your fishing going? Oh, hold on. Pretty great, actually. Oh, it's so glaring. Oh, but it's still so glaring. But I'm wearing my sunglasses. Such sunglasses, which are typically made out of materials like polycarp, plastic or glass, they um, are actually have various tints and they prevent a percentage of sunlight from actually reaching, reaching your eyes. However, there is one problem, which is that it doesn't block out UV rays. For example, your sunglasses, which are grey, while they reduce brightness and have no colour change, they actually do not block out any UV rays whatsoever. UV important? Yes. Many sunglasses nowadays, they have a UV coating, which blocks out UV light. UV light is a harmful uh, type of light, which has a, wa a wavelength of between 10 to 400 nanometers, while visible light has a wavelength of between 400 to 700 nanometers. Because this light has a much shorter wavelength, it has a higher penetrating power and much more energy. So when it hits the cornea and the lens, it will cause damage and in the lens, it can cause cataract. So over time, this can cause your vision to get very blurry. So that's why UV coating is important on sunglasses. So you're saying I should get a polarized sunglasses instead? Here's a simple analogy for how polarization works. Let's say the green part is where light can enter and the red part is essentially where light cannot enter. So essentially what polarized lenses do is that they restrict the entering of light from a specific angle. When I bend the lens at this angle, right, what happens is that no light can pass through at this specific angle because right now it's red. But whereas when I flip it at this angle, right, all the light can pass through from this direction. And at this, around 50% of the light can pass through. So this is essentially how polarized lenses work. By restricting the entering of light from a specific angle and allowing light to pass enter from a different angle. And also, more on polarization, its main role is to reduce the glare while still maintaining clarity. So it's very good for sports like skiing, sailing, and namely fishing. So because of the glare from the water, the polarization will block out the light that is coming that is not coming from the right angle. So, so is your sunglasses polarized? Yes, you, go, you may try this. Okay. This should be better. Alright. 
Ah, now I can see more fishes. Yeah. Oh. All right, give it up for ACSI and Yuslina. Now it's time for Raffles Institution and Aaron to take the stage. And the question that you got was question number one. Peanuts, dust, seafood and pollen are some common allergens. Why are some allergies seasonal and what are some remedies? I want to know as well personally. You guys have three minutes and your time starts now. Achoo! Why do I keep getting sneezes and coughs in the morning? Well, what you are facing now could be described as an allergy. An allergy has two phases, a sensitization phase and a reaction phase. A sensitization phase is when the allergen enters the body. When I enter the body, I come into contact with lots of cells, one of them being the mast cell. However, before anything serious can happen, I leave the body naturally. Now, this exposure thus causes the mast cell to produce a special type of antibodies called IgE antibodies. Now, the second phase of an allergic reaction is the reaction phase, where the allergen re-enters the body and binds strongly to the IgE antibodies on the mast cell. This causes a process called degranulation, where the mast cell produces large amounts of histamines into the bloodstream. Now, these histamines cause a lot of inflammation in all parts of the body. And that is why, my dear patient, I will prescribe you with antihistamine. Hi, I am an antihistamine. My role in the body is to reverse the effects of histamines so as to reduce symptoms and inflammation. But, but doctor, why does only some of my coughs come in the spring? Well, that can be described as something called a seasonal allergy. Seasonal allergies happen because certain allergens such as pollen are only present during certain times of the year. Oof. Oof. <laughs> Oh no, so many histamines. How am I gonna clear all of this up? This condition could be known as a severe allergic reaction or a type 1 hypersensitivity like anaphylaxis. Anaphylaxis is a severe version of an allergic reaction where the body's own mast cells severely overreact to the allergen entering the body and produces very, very large amount of histamines into the blood. This cannot be simply treated by antihistamines. So here comes the EpiPad where it releases adrenaline and helps to clear up all the remaining histamines. And that is how we solve anaphylaxis and allergic reactions. Wow, I learned so much, Doctor. Thank you. Thank you so much, Raffles Institution and Aaron. What a fantastic job. And of course, that was round three, audience's choice. Now, the judges have tabulated the raw scores. So let's take a look at how they did in round three, audience's choice. Raffles goes with 90. TJC with 75. ACSI with 85 and RI with 88. Now, we told you it could be anyone's game, really, but how do these scores affect the leaderboard? That's the big question. Remember, round three, audience's choice, has a 25% weightage. Teams, are you ready to have a look? Yes. Yeah. Fantastic. Here we go. Let's have it. RI with 55.05. ACSI and RGS are tied. CJC with 49.3. Now, only one last round stands between you and the National STEM Championship 2023 trophy. We're moving to rapid response. See you in a bit. for the most exciting and final round of the National STEM Championship 2023. I am so excited for this and nervous at the same time. Here are the rules of round four, rapid response. Our four grand finalists must answer a total of 15 open-ended questions, each within 10 seconds. Each correct answer is awarded three points. There will be no deductions for wrong answers. Without further ado, let's begin. Question number one. What free energy determines whether a reaction is spontaneous? And your 10 seconds begins now. Time's up. The correct answer is Gibbs. Yeah. Good job, everyone. Good job. Question number two. Which is the most stable allotrope of carbon? And your time begins now. Time's up. The correct answer is graphite. 
Question number three. Activated carbon removes odor by the process of what? And your time begins now. Time's up. The correct answer is adsorption. <laughs> Question number four. What is the functional group that links monomers together in terylene? And your time begins now. Time's up. The correct answer is Esther. Nobody's scoring points in this round. Question number five. What is the name of the virus that causes chickenpox? And your time begins now. <laughs> Time's up. The correct answer is varicella. Question number six. During DNA replication, what fragments are synthesized at the lagging strand? And your time begins now. Time's up. The correct answer is Okazaki. No one scoring points here. Moving on to question seven. Gout results from the buildup of what acid crystals in our joints? And your time begins now. Time's up. The correct answer is uric. <laughs> Question eight. Alpha cells of the pancreatic islet secrete the hormone what? And your time begins now. Time's up. The correct answer is glucagon. <laughs> Question number nine. Name the hypothetical particle that moves faster than light, and your time begins now. Time's up. The correct answer is tachyon. Now we're down to the last five questions. Question number 10. The sky is blue due to what scattering? And your time begins now. Time's up. The correct answer is Rayleigh. Everyone scoring points. Question 11. The what cycle provides the greatest efficiency that a classical thermodynamic engine can achieve? And your time starts now. Time's up. The correct answer is Kano. Question 12. The what constant appears in all hypotheses of quantum mechanics? And your time starts now. Time's up. The correct answer is Planck. Loving the vibe and the support here. Let's go with question 13. What gene editing technology won its discoverers the 2020 Nobel Prize in Chemistry? And your time begins now. Time's up. The correct answer is CRISPR. Final two questions. Question 14. In 2003, an outbreak of the what virus occurred in Singapore? Your time begins now. Time's up. The correct answer is SARS. Everyone scoring points. Ooh. This is a marathon right here. Final question. What is the active ingredient in the blockbuster weight loss drug, Wegovy? And your time begins now. Time's up. The correct answer is semaglutide. Nobody's scoring points here.
But with that, that was the final round of the National STEM Championship 2023. You team survived the rapid response. I'm so proud of them. That was so nerve-wracking. So we're going to take a look at the raw scores of this round. RGS with 21. TJC with 21. ACSI with 27. RI with 24. Incredible job. We're very proud of you. Good job, guys. Now, let's tally everything up. And here are the final scores for tonight's grand final. Title of the champions this year. One more big round of applause for all of them and all of their efforts. There's something very special this year. The STEM links seen here will be featured at Untamed, which is a festival happening from October to December 2023 at Science Center Singapore. Search Untamed Science Center to find out more. Now, please join me in inviting our guest of honor, Minister of State for Education and Manpower, Ms. Gan Xiao Huang, up on stage. And also, Chief Executive of Science Center Singapore, Associate Professor Lin Sik Ming, up on stage for the prize presentation. Welcome, you guys. And now, in fourth place, please give it up for TJC. <laughs> Now in third place, we have Raffles Girls School. And in second place, we have Raffles Institution. Well done, you guys. And now, the winner of the National STEM Championship 2023 is ACSI. Let's hear it for your champions. Can we have one more big round of applause for our winner? And of course, we'd also like to thank our guests of honor, Minister of State for Education and Manpower, Ms. Gan Xiao Wang, for joining us. One more big round of applause for her. And can we hear it for our guest celebrities here today, too? A big thank you to the National STEM Championship <laughs> Steering Committee, challenge contributors, judges, and partners. Can we give all of them a warm round of applause as well? But most of all, we want to thank all the people who have worked really hard behind the scenes. You know, you don't get to see them as well. Teachers, students who came here, took the time and made the effort to participate too. You are the reason why the National STEM Championship is a success year after year. And I am so happy to be able to host it. It's a privilege and honor. My name is Sonia Chu. This has been the National STEM Championship 2023. See you next time.